Hello, and welcome back to another video. This is the 12th episode of story in which the 4th Shinobi World War was over, and Naruto was finally captured by Madara. But is hope truly gone? And what the heck is happening to the Ghetto Mazo? Join our favorite blonde hero and the nine-tailed beasts on their great journey to the past. Let's see how Naruto deals with this. After you've finished watching, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. To begin, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Let's get this show going, Naruto was sent flying into a wall. His back slammed hard into the cold stone with a loud thud. What the? So this is his true power? Naruto had known that the weakest in Itachi's abilities was Taijutsu. His lack of stamina was the very clue allowing Naruto to figure out the hand of another person in the Uchiha massacre, and that Obito's words had been a complete lie. However, he had completely forgotten something even more important. Itachi, lacking in stamina or not, had still been an Anbu level shinobi, the most talented Anbu in history, to boot. His skill and experience in battle, therefore, way surpassed a 16-year-old boy like Naruto, despite the latter being sent back four years to the past. Murdering a whole elite clan might have been out of his reach, but handling one person, Jin Shiriki or not, he's definitely capable of doing. And that was the reason why his ass was being kicked around by the Uchiha although he had full access to the tail beast's chakra. The fact that he hadn't even expected something like this to happen didn't help him a little bit. Had it not been for Goku, who was a master of Taijutsu, in his head, he would have been pulverized by the relentless assault coming from the Uchiha a while ago. You're no match for me, Naruto-kun. Itachi started walking toward Naruto, his menacing figure towered over him. Surrender and come with me quietly if you don't want to get hurt even more. Crook. God damn it. What should I do now? From the right sleeve of the Akatsuki cloak Itachi was wearing poked out something, and Naruto felt a chill in his spine when he realized what it was. It was the blade of a short but incredibly sharp Taito. Sweat started rolling down Naruto's forehead. According to what Gigi told him, Tanto was the favorite weapon which Itachi was most skilled at. If he pulled it out so early in the battle, Itachi charged forward, his weapon brandished. The metal of the blade gleamed menacingly in the light of the torch in the hallway when it descended down Naruto's head. Projection. Not wasting even a second to think, Naruto willed a pair of big kunais to appear on his hands. His skill with the projection jutsu, especially with this particular weapon, had improved so much he could do it as if it was in his instinct. He brought it up to block the Tanto on Itachi's hand, which was coming down on his head. The bladed weapons met each other with a clang. Hmm. So that's your new ability, huh? Manifesting weapons from nothing? Itachi noted when pushing his Tanto down even further, grinding the blade of his weapons on Naruto's kunai in the process. So what? If it was. Naruto gritted his teeth, struggling even more to push Itachi's short sword back up. Impressive, Itachi spoke and Naruto felt scared when he realized he couldn't hear any strain in the Uchiha's voice. But having a lot of weapons, doesn't mean you have the skill to utilize all of them. Then, suddenly Naruto felt the weight which was pushing him down leaving abruptly. He jerked his head down, but his reaction could only help him lean back when Itachi's Tanto slashed horizontally across his neck, avoiding decapitation in a nick of time. A thin line of blood trickled down Naruto's neck. He backflipped a few steps, panting heavily. Never before had he felt death coming so near. What the? Is he trying to kill me or something? Is that everything you got, Naruto-kun? From the other side, Itachi taunted. There was a hint of mocking in his voice. If that's the case, I'm disappointed. There is no way you can reach the level of other Jin Churiki. Somewhere under Naruto's shock and disbelief, he felt a ripple of anger. Oh yeah? Let's see how you deal with this. Blade Storm Projection. Naruto's chakra flared and the air around him rippled. Hundreds of the same kunai faded into existence around the Jin Shuriki, and started launching themselves towards Itachi at the same time with the speed and power of bullets. Itachi's eyes narrowed. This can be dangerous. He flipped through a series of very quick hand signs. Fire style, fireball jutsu. The signature jutsu of the Uchiha clan erupted from his mouth and swept across the narrow corridor, drowning it in a sea of fire. Every kunai Naruto projected was dispelled violently before they were even able to reach Itachi, leaving puffs of smoke in the air. Then Itachi's eyes widened when he saw three Naruto flying toward him. So that's his intention, huh? The three Naruto clones charged at Itachi and started launching a relentless barrage of punches and kicks at the Uchiha. In situations like this, following no actual taijutsu style actually gave Naruto a huge advantage, instead of putting him into danger. Why? Because that way of fighting, 
while reckless and dangerous to the user, was very unpredictable. Thus, even someone of Itachi's level couldn't know where the blonde Jean Churiki was going to strike next in order to promptly stop it. And when combined with the shadow clone Jutsu, well, the problematic level was multiplied a whole lot of times. And Itachi seemed to understand that, because he didn't bother to prolong the brawl anymore. Blocking the strikes of the two clones from both sides with his arms, he leapt up and delivered a brutal kick to the crotch of the third clone, which was launching a fist at his face. The clone stopped abruptly in midair and gasped for air, leaving Itachi the opening to slash the left clone at the Adam's apple and the back of the right one's neck with just a swing. The three clones slumped to the ground. Right before a giant Rasengan flew over their heads, aiming at Itachi who hadn't recovered from his extravagant move. The sphere of chakra crashed at the rogue Uchiha's chest. Before he exploded into a flock of crows, which darted at Naruto like a storm of sharp, feathery kunais. Fuck. Naruto snarled, between heavy breaths. Behind you. Naruto's head snapped back, and he raised his hand right in time to block Itachi's kick to his head. You have great power and speed, but that's everything you have, Itachi calmly glared into Naruto's eyes. You have to remember, not everything in the world can be forced through using power. Tsukuyomi. And Naruto found everything around him disappeared, and reformed. He suddenly found himself tied up on a pole, and nine Itachi were surrounding him, each of them held a kunai on their hands. And Naruto's eyes widened when he saw in front of him the figures of Hinata, Haku, Fu, Sakura, Sasuke, Kakashi Sensei. Everyone he had ever loved in his life. The rogue Uchiha was going to. If he really was, there was no way Naruto could withstand that pain. You are within the world of Tsukuyomi, he heard the voice of the many Itachi echoing around him. In here, everything is within my control. If you don't surrender, I will just have to. Not on my watch. The world was suddenly shaken by a deafening roar coming from a certain cat. What? And before their eyes, the world started breaking down. Literally. Cracks started appearing on the creepy red moon, the eerie black sky, and the fabric of space itself. And with a loud noise as if a very, very big glass vase had just been smashed to the ground, the Tsukuyomi world shattered, and Naruto found himself back in the dark corridor of Orochimaru's base, glaring at the real Itachi who was now staggering back a few steps, his hand holding his left eye, from which a stream of blood was dripping down. You. Have just broken Tsukuyomi, Itachi said, still with the usual calm tone, but Naruto could be sure that there was now a hint of wariness in his voice. No one has ever managed that. Even people with Sharingan. Hey, Naruto grinned though he seemed a bit out of breath. Turned out I'm not that unskilled, eh? Then he raised his right hand. From his fingers, tiny hands made of chakra sprouted, and started weaving around the fingertips. In just three seconds, five small constructs made of wind chakra took form with a loud eerie wheezing noise. Multi mini Ross and Shuriken, he roared, hurling the five objects at Itachi. The mini Ross and Shuriken, while obviously no match for the original version in terms of destructive power, has a definite advantage when fighting at a very fast pace in a small and narrow battlefield, just like where they were fighting right now. This is not good. Even with only one eye, Itachi could still see the obvious danger coming straight toward him. He flicked his right arm, and from his sleeve, five kunai flew out and struck the shuriken straight at the core. The five Rasen shuriken were forcefully detonated, and the quarter was suddenly covered in a violent gust of wind, sending both combatants back a few steps. TSK. Itachi looked down on his coat. His eyes narrowed when he saw deep, gashes on the fabric. The technique hadn't even touched him, and yet. You. No, you're dangerous. Too dangerous for a boy of your age. Full control of the tailed beast, mastering a jutsu of that scale, even breaking my unbreakable genjutsu. There is no way you can advance that much in just a few months, someone like you. Who? No, what exactly are you? What I am, huh? Naruto gritted his teeth. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, a shinobi of Kanahaga Kour. And if you want to know what I am, I will show you after I kick your ass. Then he charged at the Uchiha again, with a Rasengan already spinning wildly on his hand. In retaliation, Itachi only calmly lowered his stance, ready to face the assault incoming. Let's see what else you can do. The two katanas clashed against each other, leaving a series of loud clang s on their trails. Sasuke grunted. His swordsmanship, trained by Kakashi, an adept in Kenjutsu himself, still couldn't match someone with the title of Sanin. Sure, with the Sharingan and his natural reflex, he could avoid the deadly slashes coming from Orochimaru's absurdly sharp sword, but it doesn't mean he could land any hit on the snake Sanin, either. 
and Kusanagi is definitely not a legendary sword for nothing. When buying this katana, Sasuke had chosen the sword made with the most durable material he could have found in Konoha, in order to utilize the vibration nature of lightning chakra to its fullest extent. However, a few clashes with the blade of Kusanagi had already left many chips on the blade of his own sword, even with him coating it in lightning chakra. Orochimaru swung his sword horizontally, aiming at Sasuke's shoulder. The Uchiha raised his sword to block, and the two blades clashed against each other in a notably nasty clang. Do you know, Sasuke-kun? Orochimaru grinned menacingly. In a battle between swordsmen, the one with the better sword. Crack. Crack. Oh no. This? Will be the one who wins. Crash. Sasuke's blade shattered on his hand, and the Uchiha was sent stumbling back. Not wasting even a millisecond, Orochimaru's hand lashed out, grabbing Sasuke at the neck and lifted him up. Now you're mine, Sasuke-kun, Orochimaru lipped his lips lecherously. Then he had to retract his hand quickly before Asuma's wind-infused blood cut his arm off like a twig. DCH. Asuma jumped in front of Sasuke, standing between him and Orochimaru. The usual cigarette was not on his mouth anymore, and his usual relaxed smile had also disappeared. On his face, there was only a warily stoic expression fitting of a veteran shinobi in battle. I have told you not to charge in alone recklessly like that, Sasuke. He threw a quick glance back at Sasuke, while still not letting his attention away from the snake Sanin in front of him. Only now did Sasuke realize how stupid he had been. Burning from anger and rage, he had completely forgotten, for a moment, that he was in this mission not alone, but with two other Jonin who were both stronger and more experienced in battle than him. It's just like Orochimaru's sight had sucked all the rationality out of his mind. I'm... I'm sorry, he said bitterly. I let my anger take control of my head. That won't work at all, Kuranai, from behind him, said. We can't let you fight Orochimaru if your mind state is like this. It's too dangerous. Sasuke gritted his teeth. So, now he was just a burden? As if reading Sasuke's mind, Asuma said. You are not a burden, Sasuke. But you have to calm down and cut it out with the whole cool boy, Avenger attitude. Being cool won't help you in battle, especially against someone as dangerous as Orochimaru. If you cannot control your emotions, you can't be called a good shinobi. Then he turned back to Orochimaru, but his words still aimed at Sasuke. You might be a promising Chunin of the village, Sasuke, but I am still the captain of this team for this mission. You won't rush ahead without my order. Sasuke growled. Then what will we do? Asuma glanced at where Orochimaru was standing. We need to figure out a plan first. This looks dangerous. Orochimaru looked at the raging tornado of debris and dirt in front of him wearily. He had done a lot of research about the Jinchuriki of Sunagakura before attempting to use him in the invasion. He had known that the boy possessed massive power, and had been crazy enough to abuse it solely for murder and destruction. He just had never expected that very same boy to be so calm and able to control his abilities so well. That made him way more dangerous. Gara thrusted his right hand forward. All the debris swirling around him suddenly stopped in midair and rushed toward Orochimaru like a storm of bullets of all sizes, from pebbles to cannonballs, from every direction in front of him. Crap. That's not all. From behind Gara, Tamari roared and brandished her fan. From the weapon, a violent gust of wind was sent out and boosted the speed of the projectiles to ridiculous level. So they want to play like this, huh? Summoning, Rashomon. The giant Rashomon gate popped into existence in a puff of smoke, blocking Orochimaru from the incoming barrage. The rocks crashed into the gate, one by one, causing a series of deep, gong-like notes reverberating from it. The barrage finally stopped, but the damage it had caused to the shield jutsu was obviously clear, a lot of large dents and holes were made on the very thick steel plates of the gate. To think that you can damage the Rashomon this much without even using the beast's power. Orochimaru licked his lips. You have really advanced a lot in just three months, eh? Of course I did, Gar answered coldly. And that's not the only thing I have learned during those months. Another lesson Naruto and our Konoha friends have taught me is. His hand snapped into a very quick hand, sealed before Orochimaru could react. Wind style, drilling air bullet. The cannonball made of extremely compressed air blasted the collapsing doors of the Rashomon apart and continued its way toward Orochimaru in a violent vortex of wind. Realizing the incoming danger, Orochimaru immediately weaved through his own hand seals. Earth style, five-layered earth wall. The walls made of rock and dirt rose up, hiding Orochimaru behind right before the wind sphere hit it and exploded. Orochimaru was thrown away like a ragdoll, but the barrier had protected him from the worst of the jutsu. Ugh. 
he backflipped a few steps to regain balance, that Jutsu's power could have matched the power of Shukaku itself. If he don't fight seriously, he might be killed for real. Teamwork always makes you stronger. Say what now? The ground under his feet suddenly cracked apart, and from below, something that looked like a gaping maw burst out. It was the puppet Konkuro had sent out discreetly since the start of the battle, only waiting for this moment. For the first time, the eyes of Tuya's body showed an expression of fear. The puppet closed around Orochimaru with a clack. This is so strange. Shikaku narrowed his eyes at Orochimaru and Kabuto. Orochimaru was one of the Sanin, one of the most powerful shinobi in the whole world. Even when he was not that familiar with the body of Kiyomimaru, he could still give anyone one hell of a fight if needed. And Kabuto, while not as powerful, had still proven to be a very talented shinobi, at least at Jonin level. But the way they're fighting right now. Even with those handicaps, there was no way they could fight this. This. Awkwardly. Multi-hidden shadow snake hands. Ten big snakes slashed out from under Orochimaru's sleeves with astounding speed, aiming at the three Konoha shinobi, they had to wonder how all those snakes could fit under his rather tight clothes. They bared their fangs at the shinobi, the fangs with the deadly venom which could kill people with just one fang sinking into the skin. Choza swung his staff. The force coming from the big and heavy weapon was so great it felt like the air was being ripped apart. Slamming into the snakes, it seemed to force the innard of the creatures inside out, and this time Orochimaru didn't dare to take the attack head on. He had to jump up, and the staff soared below his feet, smashing a big hole on the wall of the room. Just as I thought. That dodging wasn't because he had to, but rather because he wanted that. He wanted to open an exit to escape. Inoiki. We cannot let him escape through that hole. Orochimaru's eyes narrowed. So they have figured out, huh? Hearing the command, the Yamanaka quickly flipped through his hand seals. Mind disturbance jutsu. Immediately, Kabuto found himself losing control of his body. His limbs jerked up and his body shot towards Orochimaru, but not before grabbing a scalpel on the bed Orochimaru had just laid on. Orochimaru-sama. Kabuto's warning came right on time for Orochimaru to stop on his track to dodge the absurdly sharp knife aiming for his neck. Mind Jutsu of the Yamanaka clan. He growled. Let's see if you can bring your hand to murder your trusted assistant to escape, Inoiki said victoriously, and the controlled Kabuto pulled out another scalpel from his pouch and started slashing at the Sanin relentlessly. Orochimaru cursed, and as he opened his hand, a bone popped out from his palm, and he gripped it as a sword to fend off Kabuto's scalpels in a mad dance of swordplay. Then his eyes widened when he saw the two giant hands of Choza coming toward him from both behind and in front of him. He snarled, then delivered a brutal kick to Kabuto's stomach, sending him flying away from him. But the damage had been done, the two palms clapped together, making a violent shockwave and crushed Orochimaru between them. Orochimaru-sama. Kabuto, who managed to escape from Inoiki's jutsu thanks to Orochimaru's hit, screamed. And. Checkmate, Shikaku said with a grin. Oh, really? Shikaku's eyes widened when he saw an eerie red light coming out between Choza's palms. This is all the power of the last loyal Uchiha. Orochimaru mocked while easily deflecting Sasuke's relentless assault with the blade of his Kusanagi. You still have a way to go to catch up with Naruto-kun, Sasuke-kun. Those words definitely touched Sasuke's berserk button. Don't you dare saying things like that to me, he bellowed in rage. Chidori current. Lightning chakra blasted out from his body, shocking the breath out of Orochimaru while making a small crater on the ground. Orochimaru's mouth gaped wide. And from there, another Orochimaru crawled out and dashed away from Sasuke as fast as possible. Then suddenly he saw Asuma appearing in front of him with his pair of trench knives, lengthened with wind chakra, coming down on his head. He immediately brought Kusanagi up to block the double slash, wind met steel, making a loud, indescribable noise. Then Asuma spat a stream of scorching hot gunpowder to his face. Sasuke. Fire style, dragon flame jutsu. The gunpowder exploded into a giant fireball upon meeting the fire stream coming from Sasuke, drowning Orochimaru in it. Did we? Sasuke asked hopefully. Asuma shook his head. No, not yet. Suddenly, something burst out from underground behind them. It was Orochimaru, and he was charging straight toward Gurunai, who was standing a few feet away from them, seemingly defenseless. No. The two Konoha males shouted and shot toward the missing nin, but it was too late. The blade of Kusanagi had already pierced Kurunai's chest. Or it should have been, before Kurunai's body faded away from existence. What the? And Orochimaru found his body paralyzed in place. Genjutsu. 
He tried to mold Chakra to break the Genjutsu on him, and he smirked when the illusion on his body was broken easily. Now. What the? And he was completely shocked when he realized that he couldn't move his body an inch. He hadn't escaped from the Genjutsu at all. One layer of Genjutsu can be broken easily, but seven different layers of Genjutsu is not that easy to get out of, Orochimaru, he heard Kurunai's voice echoing everywhere around him. Now, Sasuke. And he saw Sasuke coming like a lightning bolt toward him, with Chidori blazing brightly on his left hand. His eyes widened. There is no way I will die here today. Sasuke was stopped dead on his path when an unseen force coming from Orochimaru struck him in the face. He stumbled backward, his Chidori fizzled out harmlessly on his hand. What the? Then it was the time for his own eyes to widen. Oh, crap. Did we get him? Tamari asked hopefully. Of course we did. Kankuro nodded proudly. The inside of Crow is filled with very sharp, poisonous spikes, being trapped in their equals to death. There is no way he can. Suddenly the puppet on the ground started shaking wildly. What the? The puppeteer exclaimed in panic. This is. Gara's eyes widened. He thrust his hand forward, raising his sand shield to protect all three Suna Shinobi right before the puppet exploded with a loud bang, sending pieces of wood everywhere. The three flipped back a few steps, and the Jin Shiriki's eyes narrowed when he saw what happened. Orochimaru's monstrous mouth twisted into a nasty grin. Naruto ducked to dodge Itachi's tanto coming toward his neck, then ate a brutal kick to his stomach. He grunted in pain and jumped back a few steps. This is bad. In a battlefield like this, what I think might be my advantage turns out to be my biggest weak point. What can I do now? What gave Naruto advantages during a fight with someone like Itachi were his speed and physical power. However, Itachi was one of the people who had mastered the power of the Sharingan to the maximum limit. In a linear battlefield, such as a corridor, like what they were fighting in right now, blitzing him with speed was just not an option. With the Sharingan and the innate instinct of the Uchiha clan, he could immediately predict where Naruto was going to move to and intercept him on his way. Of course, even Itachi couldn't predict how the constructs made of chakra coming from Naruto moved. That's why he didn't even bother to prolong the fight when Naruto charged at him. One hit to a vital point, such as the solar plexus or the crotch, was more than enough to send Naruto retreating. That meant neither could Naruto strike back, nor escape from the battle. What happened to you, Itachi? Naruto shouted. In his voice, the disappointment was clear. Why are you acting like this? Someone like you. You are not like this. Even though you have your reason to fight. You are still a hero. Why are you doing this? You know what the Akatsuki is doing is not anything good, right? Oh? Itachi raised an eyebrow. And why do you think that? You told Sasuke not to succumb to the darkness inside him, Naruto shouted. That's the words only a true hero can say. If you are not a hero, not fighting for the good side, why did you say those things? Hero. Huh? Naruto's spine went cold with those words coming from Itachi's mouth. I don't know much about Hero, the cold words of Itachi struck Naruto's heart again. But if you're talking about that, then I also have something to say to you. The reason I have to do this. Then suddenly, without any warning, he charged forward, his fist shot toward Naruto's stomach. Naruto raised his hands to block, but. Look out, Naruto. The Jinshiriki's eyes widened and he pushed as much chakra as he could into his arms, shoulders and hands right before the punch arrived and crashed onto his palms. And he immediately felt both his arms becoming numb as a big shockwave blasted through his body, sending him staggering back. NGH. What the hell is this? It's a technique similar to what Tsunade uses. Kokuo warned him. He focused chakra on his fist and released it upon impact, increasing the power of his punch massively. The name of this technique was once called Chakra Burst, and it has been used by a lot of famous heroes in history. But it seems he hasn't mastered it to the point he can use it as if it was in his reflex like Tsunade. Still, be careful, Naruto. One direct hit of that and you'll be dead meat. Geez, thanks a lot, Kokuo. Why did you wait until now to warn me that? Is that you are the one who ruined all the plans I have made? Then Itachi slashed at the air. Naruto felt something searing hot like a whip made of fire strike him across his chest, he grunted in pain and stumbled back. Not leaving the Jin Shuriki even one second to recover, the rogue Uchiha rushed him, and Naruto's eyes widened when he saw the blade of the Tonto coming toward his shoulder being covered in a deep blue flame. Crap. A mere kunai wouldn't be enough to withstand this blow. He needed a better weapon. A weapon which could stand against any powerful force. Which could stand against time itself. But what could it be? 
His hand touched something in his kunai pouch. Without even thinking, he brought it up, and a loud clang echoed through the air. And not only Itachi's, but Naruto's own eyes also widened in shock. What the? Because the thing he was holding on his hand was the very same tripronged kunai his father had left him. The knife was old and a bit rusty, but it still held itself firmly against the blazing blade of Itachi's Tanto, not budging even a little bit. Not wasting a second, Naruto grabbed the handle of the kunai with both hands like a sword and swung hard, and this time, Itachi's Tanto flew out of his hand. It spun on the air one, two, three times, and lodged itself into a crack on the wall. Now that's a surprise, Itachi staggered backward a few steps, but his eyes still glued to the new weapon on Naruto's hand. I didn't expect to face the weapon of the fourth here. Wow. I didn't know dad's kunai is so strong. It is that old, and yet. It's not that surprising. As far as I know, there is a high chance the metal used to make this kunai is mithril. The unfamiliar name actually stopped Naruto on his track a bit. Mithril? Yeah. It is one of the most powerful metals in the surface of this planet, much stronger than steel, yet lighter than aluminium, and is a highly effective chakra conductor too. It's a surprise that someone can acquire so much of this metal to forge all those kunai for your father. Then. Naruto grinned. He stood up straight and pointed the knife at Itachi. It's time for me to strike back. What the hell is that? Tamari said in disgust upon looking at the monstrous form Tuya's old body had just taken. This must be what Baki Sensei talked about. The cursed seal in action. Konkuro grimaced. He broke my favorite puppet. I thought Crow was your favorite puppet? Oh shut up. Is this the time for them to talk about that? Shukaku, of all people, complained. Gara just raised an eyebrow. I must commend you, Tuya's twisted voice rose, sending chills to Tamari and Konkuro's spines. You, a bunch of Jinan who didn't even pass the Chunin exam before, have managed to force me to use the cursed seal's power. But that is going to end. Because. Gara's eyes narrowed when he saw his enemy pulling out something from his pocket. It was something long. Wooden. A flute. He's going to use a sound jutsu. But the Tsuna Shinobi had already prepared for this. Before the mission, they had researched about Odogakura and their shinobi, and had figured out what kinds of technique they tended to use. And they had prepared special earplugs to counter the effect of those sound-based techniques. It's alright. If he uses sound, it won't have any effect anyway. But. Orochimaru's mouth twisted into another nasty grin, and he put the flute onto his mouth and started playing. And the air around them started trembling. What? What the? Tamari's eyes narrowed. She realized that technique, after all, she had seen it before, during the invasion. It wasn't a genjutsu, but rather, an injutsu using the user's chakra to create sound waves to assault the enemies. A similar technique had been used by that bastard Zaku, using the holes on his hands to focus the sound waves into a straight blast toward the enemies, increasing its power and range. But this. Instead of focusing it into a blast, it would. She immediately grabbed her fan, and with a hard swing, her massive wind scythe jutsu tore through the air and clashed with the sound waves coming toward them. Wind, after all, was also the movement of the particles in the air, very similar to sound, so when the two forces clashed against each other, they gnashed and gnarled and roared, then finally cancelled each other with a loud whoosh. Oh? It seems you're not too bad, eh, Tamari-chan? Each words coming from Orochimaru's mouth sent chill into Tamari's body. She shouted. Bastard. I don't need you to compliment me. Really? Then. Orochimaru smirked. The deep voice of Orochimaru coming from the body of a young girl like Tuya was already creepy enough. Now, coming from the monstrous form of that very same body, it became even creepier. He bit his finger and weaved through hand seals, then slammed his palm onto the ground. Summoning Jutsu. From the burst of smoke appeared three giant figures. They looked like three huge, muscular ogres, with their eyes and ears covered by linen and wielded different weapons, a club and a pair of claw-like gauntlets. The last one didn't have a weapon, but its legs were much more muscular and deadly than the other two. Now, Orochimaru put the flute on his mouth and played. Immediately, the limbs of the three monsters started moving. They brandished their weapons, and with a sudden, fast movement, all of them launched themselves at the three Sunashinobi. Gara's eyes widened and he thrust his hand forward. The sand wall immediately rose around the three shinobi to protect them. But. What the? Tamari could only exclaim those words when the oni using the club smashed through Gara's sand barrier like tearing a sheet of paper apart. She jumped back, and skidded on the ground right before the heavy weapon crashed on the ground right where she had been standing just one second ago. 
Gara's automatic sand barrier was a very effective technique to defend against normal ninjutsu and taijutsu. However, if the power of the jutsu was too great, it could easily plow through the barrier, as Sasuke's Chidori had done during the Chunin exam in Naruto's timeline, as the barrier was just a wall of sand. The thicker the sand wall was, the slower it could move around, and the less effective the defense would be. Glancing at the other sides, she saw Kankuro and Gara also being attacked by the two other ogres. She gritted his teeth. None of them was a taijutsu specialist, nor had enough physical power to match those monsters in a straight power fight, except for Gara. But Gara alone could not protect both of them while stopping those monsters. Meanwhile, Gara was still keeping his stoic expression. He thrust his arms to the sides, and two waves of sand burst out from the ground, pushing the two Oni away from his siblings. The one without arms immediately charged him at full speed and delivering a brutal kick to the Jin Shuriki's chest, but the sand barrier immediately rose in front of him, and as Gara's eyes hardened, more and more sand started reinforcing the wall. The feet of the ogre crashed against it, and the shock wave washed through the combatants. Gara flicked his hand. The sand, which had just stopped the attack from the three ogres, surged up and bound the monsters in place. Sand burial. With a sickening pop, the lower bodies of the ogres were crushed like three eggs being stomped on by an elephant. Good. His weapons are disabled. Tamari cheered. But immediately, to her horror, the monsters started climbing up. And before the widened eyes of the Suna Shinobi, the destroyed parts of their bodies grew back, and only in three seconds, the ogres was as good as new again. Of course it can't be that easy. Tamari grumbled. She raised her folded fan to block the strike of the club-wielding ogre, and winced when the weapon shook dangerously upon impact, sending numbness down her arms. What the fuck are you doing, Kankuro? Tamari snarled at her brother when the three Suna Shinobi gathered into the Manji formation. She swung her fan, blasting the ogres away, but they recovered almost immediately and continued their assault just as relentless as before. But the puppeteer didn't answer her. Instead, his eyes were narrowing at the three monsters in front of him, but he didn't do anything except dodging the blows coming at him. Something about them intrigued him. Something he was sure he had never heard of before. But at the same time, it was so familiar to him. Like something he had been practicing every day. But what was it? Then his eyes met the flute on Orochimaru's hands. Could it be? Gara, Tamari. Kankuro only called their names, but that was already more than enough for the siblings who had grown up together for years to understand. Tamari immediately swung her fan at the ground, and sand and debris was sent flying, making a smoke screen allowing the Suna Shinobi to back away from the three monsters' attack range. What's going on? Tamari hissed. If we don't find a way to get past those demons, there's no way we can touch Orochimaru. Yes, Kankuro answered her calmly. But if we fight like this, we won't be able to do anything. Those monsters are designed to fight people like you and Gara, people who use great power to break through everything. If we continue fighting like this, soon we will get tired and become nice, easy targets for them to kill. Then what do you think we need to do? The blonde girl gritted her teeth. Then she realized. Wait, you said designed. Could it? Yes, Kankuro grinned. Those monsters are just puppets, just like my crow and salamander. But instead of using chakra strings, what Orochimaru was using to control them is the flute he was playing. It was no different from how my puppet art works. If we can understand the pattern, we can easily counter their moves. Right, Gara nodded. But there is only one person who can do it, it was you. Kankuro closed his eyes. Then, after three seconds, he opened them again. But this time, they bore a grim expression. There is a technique Chiyosama taught me. If we manage to pull it, we will have a chance to break through. But I still haven't fully mastered it yet. Do you guys trust me to use it? Silence. Then Gara nodded and gripped his brother's hand. You are our brother, Kankuro. Of course we trust you. Just do it, and we will do everything to assist you. The puppeteer grinned. Then. When the smoke screen died down, Orochimaru raised an eyebrow when he saw Tamari and Gara rushing at him, just like before. Those two didn't learn their lesson. A. Hey. He put the flute back onto his mouth and continued playing. Immediately, the three ogres sprang to action again. They jumped into the way of the sand siblings, and the club-wielding ogre swung its hefty weapon down on Tamari's head with a blinding speed. If the hit connected, the girl's head would be smashed for sure. But. Right before the strike could land, Kankuro had flicked his right index finger. At the same time, Gara's right arm thrust upward, and suddenly from below, a sand geyser erupted, sending the ogre flying. The claw-holding one jumped at Gara, 
trying to impale him through the sand barrier with its absurdly sharp weapon, but Konkuro flicked his other hand, and Tamari spun on her feet, sweeping both remaining monsters aside with her full power wind scythe jutsu. All of those were done without the siblings even losing their speed. So that's it. Using the chakra string, he takes control of his two siblings' bodies like puppets and guides them from outside the fight to negate the opening they show when defending the other. That will allow them to advance toward me without losing their speed. That accursed puppet art of that old woman. In this tactic, the puppeteer would take the role of the tactician, moving the pieces which were the two other members according to his strategy. The most effective way to stop this tactic was to stop the tactician. But if he tried to get his minions to attack the puppeteer, the two others would reach him in just a few more steps. And they weren't puppets, they're true human. Even if that brat died, Orochimaru wouldn't be able to live, either. How dare you brats! Forcing me back this much. The Tsuna Shinobi was getting very close. Only a few more steps and they would reach Orochimaru. But at that moment, Orochimaru removed the flute from his mouth, took a deep breath and, wah! Gara and Tamari bounced off an invisible shield made of sound and staggered back. The atmosphere around them was also vibrating furiously, and Tamari had to cover her ears and reflex, even with the earplugs intact. And they had stayed still a second too long. In that very same second, the flute had returned to Orochimaru's mouth, and now, all three ogres were aiming at the most vulnerable member of the trio, Tamari, who was now on the ground, holding her ears. Shit, Gara shouted, and clapped his hands together. A thick wall of sand sprang up around Tamari, blocking the three simultaneous strikes coming from the three ogres, but at the same time, he made a fatal mistake. Leaving himself wide open. And the sword of Kusanagi was coming toward him as Orochimaru let go of the flute and charged him like a storm. Gara's eyes widened. Splurt. No, Ga. The horrified gasp of Tamari choked within her throat when she saw her brother being stabbed to the hilt with a sword, of everything. So this is everything the invincible defense can do? Orochimaru smirked. So disappointing. I have expected something better from you. He didn't expect to see the grin on Gar's face. A Naruto-ish grin. Quite the contrary. Gotcha. His eyes widened when Gara suddenly grabbed his wrist with both his hands. Then he suddenly felt the back of his head being struck by something, hard. And strangely, after striking him at the back, that something just seemed to stick there, not letting go of him. Then another thing struck him at the knee, nearly breaking his bones. Then another struck him at the forearm. And the left shoulder. And the spine. And everywhere on his body. What the? The reason I let you stab me? Was because it was the easiest way to get close to you, Gara stumbled back a few steps, but on his mouth was a victorious smile. Do you think that all the debris I brought up earlier was for nothing? They are all imbued with my positive magnet style chakra, and when I channel my negative magnet style chakra into you. It's over, Orochimaru. You are going to die here. And now. The last piece of debris collided with a loud boom, and Orochimaru was now buried under a big, heavy pile of rubble. There was no way his bones could stay intact under such a heavy direct barrage. And only after that did Gara allow his body to collapse to the ground. Gara, He has entered the cursed seal form, huh? Asuma narrowed his eyes at the two-headed humanoid body in front of him. From the brief fight they had had before, it was obvious that the ability of this body was tremendous. He could use collaboration jutsu single-handedly with the assistance of the head at the back, and it was very powerful, too. And with the curse seal activated, the power obviously would be boosted to a different level. However, was it really all of it? There was something else about the enemy in front of him which made his instinct scream in wariness. The chakra, the power of the jutsu wasn't everything. Maybe there was something else in his special ability. That second head? Well, standing here thinking would not solve anything. He glanced at Sasuke, who was standing right next to him. And somehow, that glance alone made Sasuke understand his plan. He nodded with a gulp. Then, with a very sudden and quick movement, Asuma pulled a handful of kunai from his pouch and threw them toward Orochimaru. And on their trajectory, they suddenly split into eight more each, all coming down on Orochimaru's head. He's trying to overcome Orochimaru with sheer number. Sasuke, who was observing, thought quietly. But that won't do anything against someone like Orochimaru. Then suddenly, a loud bang shook the air. All the kunai simultaneously increased in velocity and shot toward Orochimaru, so fast it broke the speed of sound. Even Orochimaru couldn't dodge something like that, kunai after kunai pierced his new body, making hole after hole on the monster's flesh. Orochimaru collapsed to the ground. And melted into a pile of dirt. Earth clone. 
Of course it would be. Asuma gritted his teeth. I didn't know Asuma Sarutobi could pull out something like that. You really have grown a lot since the last time I saw you, eh? The three Konoha Shinobi were startled when the real Orochimaru emerged from underground between where they were standing. They kicked the ground, making a distance between themselves and Orochimaru, and immediately went through hand seals. Three blasts of elemental jutsu shot toward the snake Sanin, and the latter leapt up to avoid. The blasts only flew below his feet harmlessly. Then suddenly Orochimaru felt Asuma right next to him, his knife raising high. The blade of the knife was extended into a broad, long wind sword, and was coming down on the nape of his neck, where the two bodies were joined. A sword made of wind itself is unblockable. And with this close distance, there was no way for Orochimaru to dodge the attack from Asuma without having at least one head decapitated. But if he didn't dodge, he would be cut in half. You little. Splurt. The body of Orochimaru split into two, avoiding the slash of Asuma right at the brink of being separated by force. And that was the very thing Asuma was waiting for. From his place, Sasuke sprang into action. With a quick leap, he charged Ukon's body which had just been ejected from Sakon's body. From a seal drawn on his wrist, eight shuriken popped out, and he launched them at the body with all his might. They flew around Orochimaru's body and tied it up with the strings attached into them before the body could even touch the ground. Soon, the split body of Orochimaru was tied up into a cocoon on the ground, not being able to move his hand or even opening his mouth. Just as I thought. Something like that shouldn't have been able to touch him, but. That body isn't used to moving on its own, that's why its reaction to Sasuke's technique was so slow. Sasuke clapped his hands together, and with the tips of the strings gathered in his mouth, he announced his final jutsu. Fire style, dragon flame jutsu. The raging dragon of fire exploded from Sasuke's mouth and rushed on the string bridge toward Orochimaru, who could only widen his eyes in surprise and consumed him, drowning him in the small inferno. At the same time, the Sakon body of Orochimaru suddenly cringed up, letting his stance open, and that opening was more than enough for Asuma to close in and thrust his flying swallow straight through his heart. Gah! It's over, Orochimaru, Asuma said curtly. No matter how strong you are, you won't be able to escape this. Strike air. The blade of wind which was going through Orochimaru's heart exploded into a violent tornado, tearing the snake Sanin's new body apart from the inside. Even his snake gathering technique couldn't help him when all of his organs were destroyed like that. W. We won, Sasuke breathed out, and slumped down on the ground butt first. Yeah, Asuma nodded, and deactivated his wind blade. It was kinda too anticlimactic, though. You're exactly right, the voice of Kurunai suddenly rose. Look. The two males looked, and their eyes immediately widened. Before their eyes, the corpses of Orochimaru started to melt. In just three seconds, the two corpses were just two other piles of mud on the ground. There was no other sign of Orochimaru on the battlefield anymore. You think? You've already? One? The three Suna Shinobi turned to Orochimaru, who had just gasped out those words. Don't waste your breath, Orochimaru, Konkura snorted. You will never get out of there with that messed up body. Just lie in there and wait for your death, no one would be able to rescue you. Hey! Even being crushed inside two tons of rock and debris, Orochimaru still managed to pull out a snarl. If only. I could use my. Special substitution. But no matter. This is not the end. Then his mouth suddenly twisted into a menacing grin. Farewell to you, brats. Gara's eyes widened. Shit. Back away, you two. The pile of rock which Orochimaru was being trapped inside suddenly exploded with a deafening boom, sending all the debris flying at the three shinobi. Thankfully, most of them were stopped by Gara's sand barrier before they could harm the siblings. What was that? Tamari stared at where the pile had been standing just five seconds ago. Did he suicide? No. Gara grimaced. It was just a shadow clone. Naruto had used the jutsu on me, when we fought before. Hey guys, look at this. Konkuro's voice snapped them out of the confusion. They ran to the coffin containing Orochimaru, where Konkuro was standing and staring down with a grimace. This. There was a gaping hole inside the coffin. Under it, there was also a tunnel which one single person could fit inside. The marks showed that it had just been dug recently. That bastard. He knew that he couldn't take on all of us in this state, so he sent a shadow clone to distract us when he ran away. We are all so stupid. Konkuro slammed his fist down on the coffin with a snarl. Now who knows where that son of a bitch has gone? Tamari also growled. Next to them, Gar didn't say anything for a while. And then, without any warning, he collapsed on the ground.
Gara, Tamari exclaimed in horror. What's wrong? That sword Orochimaru was using must have had poison. Kankuro kneeled down and checked the wound on Gara's stomach. True to the point, there was some sickly purple liquid leaking out of it. We cannot move him, or the poison will spread. Tamari's eyes widened. Her brother, her supposedly invincible brother, was going to die. Then what? What should we do? Right at the time, three other people appeared on the clearing. It was Shizun and two Anbu members, who had been sent by the Hokage as reinforcement. Thank goodness I could catch up with you. The Jonin exclaimed. What happened? Where is Orochimaru? Orochimaru has run away. Can you please help my brother? He's going to die. Shizun cringed. Even though she had only seen the Sunakunoichi a few times, she still could never expect the girl's eyes being full of tears and anguish, just like right now. She kneeled on the ground, patting the girl on the back. Okay, okay. Let me see what I can do. What are you doing, Genma? Hayate blinked when he saw his teammate trying to move the bloody boulders in front of them. We have to check whether Orochimaru is really dead or not, the elite guard member answered, still not stopping his work. Don't you think you're wasting your effort? The swordsman raised an eyebrow. No one can survive that avalanche, Orochimaru or not. Whatever, Genma growled. Are you helping me or not? I'm still the leader of this team for this mission, you know. All right, all right, Hayate sighed, then casted some hand signs. With a loud crack, the pile of rubble collapsed one by one, and soon, what used to be a whole collapsed canyon became just a deserted field. How? Ninjutsu, chakra magic, blah blah, whatever it might be. Hayate winced when he saw the mess of blood and flesh used to be under the pile of boulders. Wow. Shouldn't have done that. Son of a bitch. Both Hayate and Shikamaru were startled by the sudden shout of their leader. What's wrong, Genma-san? Shikamaru asked. Orochimaru has escaped. Those words were no different from thunder exploding right next to their ears. What do you mean? How could he escape that? Hayate nearly shouted at Genma. The elite guard only pointed to the ground. Who knows? Just look at this. The two other Konoha shinobi looked, and grimaced at the same time. On the ground, there was definitely a corpse wearing the same outfit as Orochimaru before. But if anyone looked closely at it, they could see it was completely empty. Just like a snake had just shed its skin. This means, said Hayate hesitantly. Yes, Genma nodded grimly. We failed. No one realized Shikamaru's hands curling into fists, his nails digging into his skin angrily. You are not even trying to fight us, you are just finding a chance to escape, is it, Orochimaru? Shikaku asked, his eyes glued to Orochimaru, not letting any movement of the rogue Sanin out of his sight. Orochimaru chuckled. Kukaku. Indeed, nothing can escape the eyes of the greatest strategist of Kanaha, eh? As long as we're here, you will never get out of this place alive, Choza boasted confidently, slamming the head of his staff on the ground. Oh really? Orochimaru let out a disturbing snicker which didn't fit Kimimaro's monstrous body at all. Kimimaro's body is the most powerful of all the Sound 5, I can destroy all of you if I go all out on it. But why bother? Then he bit his finger and ran through hand seals with a blinding speed. Shikaku's eyes widened when he suddenly felt a surge of chakra coming from Orochimaru which even someone who was not a sensor could feel it. Summoning Jutsu. The chamber exploded when Manda, the king of snakes, appeared and blasted the ceiling off with his sheer size only. He thrashed around, sending the three Konoha shinobi flying when roaring madly. Orochimaru. How dare you summon me into this blasted hole of your den? Do you want me to eat you alive? Crap. Manda's tail lashed out wildly, and Choza had to enlarge his whole body in order to block it for his teammates. But even with that, he still winced due to the humongous force slamming at his chest. And in just that moment, Orochimaru and Kabuto had disappeared through the new opening. Damn it! Orochimaru and Kabuto have run away. Inoiki cursed, but with the gigantic snake thrashing around, there was no way he or any of the Konoha shinobi could follow the two missing nins. We have to get out of here first, Choza said urgently and before his teammates could answer, his hands swooped down on their heads, grabbing them and taking them away from the giant snake with a leap from Choza, leaving him behind to spend his rage on the poor Otto Shinobi who had just arrived at the site, completely oblivious of what was happening in the room they had been locked out of. We have failed, Choza said bitterly. Those words alone were enough to express the feeling of the three Konoha Shinobi right now. For a few minutes, no one said anything, accompanying them was just utter silence. Then Shikaku suddenly stopped dead on his track. What's wrong, Shikaku? Inoiki looked at his team leader and blinked. 
Everyone, brace yourself and listen to this, Shikaku answered. His eyes still didn't leave his palm, where the communication seal was lying. In his face was a dreadfully grim expression. What? The Nara looked up. Every other team has failed to kill Orochimaru. They have escaped. All of them. Then it means. Yes, Shikaku closed his eyes. This mission is a complete, utter failure. What a drag. Itachi and Naruto's weapons clashed against each other in a series of deafening clangas. Naruto sprang back on his feet, breathing heavily. So far, he had managed to hold his own against Itachi with his new weapon. However, he knew that it wouldn't be long before he slipped and allowed the rogue Uchiha to deliver the final blow. That kunai of yours is indeed very good, he heard Itachi's voice from the other side of the corridor. As expected from the weapon of the fourth Hokage. But I still haven't seen you using the flying thunder god jutsu. Could it be? The voice of the rogue Uchiha drew out tauntingly. You don't know how to use it? Naruto gritted his teeth angrily at the taunt of his enemy. You said I was the one ruining your plan. He growled. What is your plan? And why does it involve me? Tell me. He screamed out the last part in a voice full of rage. Itachi's eyes gaze across his face calculatingly. Then, the Uchiha said in an eerily calm voice. You want to know what you did? Fine. I'll tell you. Your friendship with Sasuke. Is what ruined my plan. That answer definitely wasn't the answer Naruto was looking for. What? Your unbelievably fast growth is starting to become a nuisance to the Akatsuki, Itachi answered. And with your successes at defending the village from the Tsunaji and Chiriki, at bringing Tsunade Sama back to the village. The citizens of the village, including Sasuke, are starting to love you more and more. If I let you free, soon you will become a threat not only to Sasuke, but also to the whole village when the Akatsuki decides to attack for real. The less people there are who love you, the less anguish they would be when you're finally captured. Naruto couldn't believe what he had just heard. So to you I'm just a scapegoat for your so-called greater good? Yes, Itachi answered without even having to think. Either that was a blatant lie, or that boy is really messed up in his head, Isabu commented. Naruto's blood boiled. Don't screw with me. Multi-shadow clone jutsu. Naruto clones filled the corridor in a big burst of smoke. Charge, he roared, and clone after clone rushed Itachi with Rasengan on their hands. Itachi calmly disposed of the clones charging at him with his sword, but his eyes widened when another clone rushed him from below, only to be dispelled by a kick to the face. And another clone aimed a Rasengan at his neck, and was disposed by a slash to his own neck. And another clone. And another clone. And another clone. Worse, every time he disposed one clone, another one appeared to replace it. NGH. This was becoming a battle of attrition. There was no end to those clones, and if he didn't do anything, Soon he would be drowned under the sheer number of Naruto's rushing him. Going all out was something he really didn't want to do. But if things had become like this. Amaterasu. All the clones were engulfed in the black, searing hot flame in just a blink of an eye. And Naruto's own eyes widened when Itachi turned his eyes toward him. Shit. It was for turning for him to move his feet, because right after he lift them from the place, the ground under him also burst into flame. Crap crap crap. If I stop moving, I will be burned into a crisp. Having fought Sasuke and Itachi a lot of times, Naruto understood quite well how dangerous the black flame of Amaterasu was. That wicked fire could burn through everything. Even Chakra. One touch of the flame to his body would be able to take away one of his limbs, just like what it had already done to the right arm of the fourth Rakage during his timeline. If he let himself be caught in Itachi's sight, he's definitely done for. Up, down, left, right. Everywhere he could put his feet, the flame followed him. He could outrun it. But. For how long? Suddenly he felt his body flying across the air. Not being able to watch where he was going, he had tripped on a rock. Whether it was just a random rock lying there or one Itachi conjured to deliberately trip him, he didn't know. The only thing he knew was that now he was flying uncontrollably, his limbs flailing around in the air uselessly. His back slammed painfully into the wall in front of him, and that was the very opening Itachi had been waiting for. In a blink of an eye, the rogue Uchiha had appeared in front of him, and with a sickening squelch, the blade of his tanto buried itself into Naruto's stomach. Time seemed to stop right at that moment. Naruto gasped out when the short sword pierced his torso. The pain wrecked through his body, it felt like his inner organs were being torn apart by the absurdly sharp blade going through them. But Itachi didn't just stop there. With professional, quick movements, the rogue shinobi pinned Naruto's limbs into the wall with one, two, three. Four of his special kunais. Naruto couldn't even let out a scream from agony. 
air seemed to be drained forcefully out of his lungs. His body went limp, the chakra cloak faded away harmlessly. I really didn't expect you to fight back this fiercely, Itachi looked down on Naruto's limp body, which was being hanged up by the kunai's embedded into his limbs. But I'm afraid this will be the end for you, Naruto-kun. Is this really the end? Naruto thought, feeling his consciousness fading away. I'm going to end like this. Then he felt something stirring inside him. Inside Naruto, the tailed beasts could only look helplessly. No. Matatabi held her mouth with her paws in horror. Damn it. Jinki growled. I knew there is no way Naruto is experienced enough to face someone like Itachi alone. There is no other choice. Even though it's highly dangerous. Goku gritted his teeth. I will take over his body for a while and get Yuz out of here first. But before the ape could do anything, all the tailed beasts were suddenly shoved away violently with chakra. Raging, mad chakra. In her beast form, Saikyo didn't have eyes. But that didn't mean she couldn't see what was happening outside. And as a tailed beast, she was basically just a giant mass of chakra. It meant things like, flesh and blood were something she didn't have. But what was happening right now somehow seemed to make her blood go cold and boil at the same time. Terrible things in her life flashed through her mind. She saw Hashirama Gigi being impaled by Madara's sword. She saw Udakata Nichan being pierced by Pain's black rods. And now. Naruto Nichan was being skewered by Kunai's and sword. He was going to die. In front of her. Just like both of her previous Jinchuriki. And everything around her went red. Now, it's time to get you back to the Akatsuki. Suddenly, everything around Itachi started to rumble. What the? A loud boom shook the world. Itachi was thrown away like a rag doll by a force so great and sudden he couldn't even react. He was sent rolling on the floor uncontrollably, but finally, he managed to stand up, albeit a bit shakily. And his eyes narrowed. Uh-oh. Naruto's body was once again covered with chakra. But different from before, instead of the vibrant orange chakra shroud wrapping around him like a cloak, Naruto right now looked just like a black and red abomination with six tails twisting in the air. The monstrous figure roared, and Itachi felt the whole corridor around him shudder. It's alright. Calm down. This happening means he lost his control. Without control of the beast's chakra, he won't be as dangerous. The abomination snarled. Then, without warning, it slammed its hands on the ground, hard. And Itachi immediately regretted what he had just thought. From underground, giant spiky vines erupted in a furious storm of debris. Itachi's eyes widened when the vines shot toward him like vengeful spears. He jumped back and shot a fireball at the spears made of vine, but the appendages tore the technique apart like it was nothing. Amaterasu, Itachi shouted, and the black flame once again erupted, burning the trees aiming for him to crisp. But he gritted his teeth when more and more trees burst out from the ground and charged him, even fiercer than before. He frantically jumped left and right, barely managing to avoid the furious spiky vines which were all hell-bent on skewering him to bits. For the first time in the whole battle, the stoic Uchiha's face showed an expression of fear. I can't die here. Not now. Chakra was poured into both of his eyes. This was his final trump card, only used in a life or death situation. But he couldn't afford to hold back now. With a roar, the skeleton form of Itachi's Susano flared into existence. The chakra construct started gathering itself up, and before everyone could know, it had emerged in its matured form. The sword of Tatsuka was drawn from its scored sheath, and with a wide swing, a large portion of the forest of thorny plants was cut off. The Susano swung its sword down. A shockwave shot out of the blade, cutting through the forest of stumps and rushing toward the possessed Naruto. The abominable boy snarled, and let out a deafening roar. The shockwave was stopped dead on its track by the sheer power of the roar, making a boom which shook even the ground. The possessed Jinchuriki slammed his palms on the ground again and another wave of plants burst out and launched themselves at Itachi again. But this time, with Susano, Itachi easily cut them down as if they were twigs. Suddenly, seven noticeably large vines snapped out and wrapped themselves around Susano, locking the humanoid structure in place. The chakra structure tried to struggle, but the vines were just too strong. They squeezed the Susano with a strength no one could ever expect something like those vines could have ever done. The sword of Tatsuka and Mirror of Yada were both powerful, deadly weapons. But even they were nothing if the user couldn't move his hand to use them. Crook. Itachi grunted. He was starting to feel the drawback of the technique. It was just like thousands of needles were stabbing into his body. And his Susano, being an imperfect creation, was starting to crack under the pressure of the vines. He couldn't prolong this fight anymore. 
HRRRRGGGH. With a loud battle cry, Itachi pushed the remaining of his chakra into the technique. The cracks on the construct weren't repaired, but it was starting to advance into the complete form. If it managed to reach that form, there might be a chance for him to escape from the bind and counter-attack. Then he felt something bright and hot rushing toward him. The tailed beast bomb from the possessed Naruto shot through the air and pierced the head of the evolving Susano in a beam of light. The power of the blast was so great it ripped not only the whole head apart, but also a large chunk of the forest of vines and didn't stop until it was only a dot on the sky. Being damaged beyond repair, the chakra construct started breaking down, piece by piece. At the same time, Itachi curled up, choking on his own saliva. Everything blurred in his eyes, he had pushed himself past his limit. Using Susano had put too much of a strain into his life force. He had underestimated his opponent too much, and now he had to pay the price. A sharp vine lashed at him through the gaping hole on where used to be the head of Susano. Itachi closed his eyes, he was going to be killed, before his plan was even put into motion. And he was so shocked and surprised when the tip of the vine stopped right in front of his forehead right before they could pierce his brain. Naruto opened his eyes, only to see nothing around him except for a dark red color. What the hell is this? This is your mindscape, Naruto. Naruto jumped his eyes glancing around looking for the source of the voice. It was Kurama's voice, but he couldn't see her in the blank space she had just called his mindscape. Kurama? Guys? Where are you? I can't see you. Why does my mindscape become like this? After seeing you impaled by Itachi, Saikyo snapped, this time, it was the voice of Kokuo echoing around him. She took over your body by force without even knowing about it, and is now destroying everything both inside and outside your body. If we don't do anything to stop her soon, you and everything around here will be crushed. Maybe we should just let her kill the bastard first, Goku commented snidely. This is not the time for that. Matatabi's voice rose impatiently. If we don't do something soon, not only Naruto-kun's body will be wrecked, but who knows if we would be able to survive or not. Urgh. Even though Naruto couldn't see his face, he could still feel the embarrassment in the tailed beast's voice. Alright, Naruto, finally, after a few seconds, Kurama's voice boomed. First we will have to find Saikyo. Unless we can see her, there is no way to stop her. But in a place like this. Don't worry, I can do it. Those words had slipped out of Naruto's mouth before he even realized what he was saying. After a tense silence, Chomei asked tentatively. Are. You sure? I'm sure, Naruto nodded. I cannot explain, but somehow. I can feel where she is. It's just a slight sensation. But I'm very sure she is there. And she's... hurt? In pain? I don't know. But she's definitely needing my help. I'm going to bring her back. Walking, or as Naruto would describe, swimming in a sea of red chakra like this was definitely not an easy job. Sometimes Naruto felt like he was being swept away by the sheer power of the chakra. Luckily, this was his mindscape, not the outside world, so he didn't have to worry about being burned into a crisp by the powerful chakra. But in the end, he found her. Saikyo was there snarling and growling at something he couldn't see, her chakra writhing angrily around her. Seeing the tailed beast like this, Naruto felt as if his heart were being crushed. He really couldn't imagine the rampaging creature in front of him right now was the same sweet and gentle girl he usually saw at home. He reached out, and called. saikyo chan Hearing the call, Saikyo snapped her head back. And Naruto was thrown off his feet violently by the massive wave of chakra the slug blasted at him. The boy was tossed across his mindscape. His face skidded painfully on the ground before he could stagger back to his feet. He wiped the blood off his mouth and muttered. Of course it can't be that easy. How in the world Naruto could bleed in his mindscape, no one could even know. Saikyo chan stop. The blonde Jinchuriki called toward the slug. Snap out of it. I'm still here. I haven't died yet. Naturally, those words couldn't reach the beast's ears. If she had ears at all. I will have to get close to her first. Wait, Naruto. Stop. It's too dange. But Naruto didn't even hear what Kurama was saying. His body had already shot forward to where the rampaging tailed beast was at. He had just known Saikyo for a few months. But somehow. He could never imagine her being so furious, so. Crazy. Tentacles made of chakra shot toward him. But he dodged left and right, avoiding the deadly appendages and plunged himself ahead without even hesitating or losing his speed. Then a tentacle swept a horizontal arc, slamming at his stomach sending him flying. Crook. Naruto once again sprawled on the ground. He groaned and pushed himself up. 
he really didn't expect to fight another battle when he was already in a battle like this. What are you doing, Naruto? He heard the voice of Juki asking impatiently. You can use the power of your seal to restrain her. Why haven't you done it? Naruto gritted his teeth. Of course he knew about that. But. Even thinking about that made him feel disgusted with himself. How could he bring himself to do that to someone like Saikyo? Someone he, even knowing that she was far older than him, still considered his little sister. Snap out of it Naruto. Juki's voice once again rose urgently. You cannot afford to hesitate now. Your body is already breaking down from overdose of chakra. If you let this continue, we will all die, there won't even be a Saikyo for you to save. What? He looked up, and even though he didn't understand what it meant, he could still feel there was something going wrong. The air around him was becoming a deep, dark red color. Like blood. That definitely couldn't be anything good. Sorry Saikyo chan but this is for everyone's, and for your own good. He put his hand on the seal on his stomach and twisted it. Itachi Sharingan didn't take long to notice what was happening to Naruto. The crazy chakra had retreated back into the boy's body, and the cruel, mad rampage of the sea of plants had halted its way. Naruto's body seemed to be damaged quite a bit, but it was starting to recover when he was looking. This would be his only chance. The fading Susano immediately plunged its remaining intact hand into its chest, snatching Itachi out. Then, with a wide movement of the arm, it threw the rogue Uchiha toward Naruto just like the greatest fastball the world had ever seen. The Uchiha flew like a cannonball at Naruto, and the blonde Jinchuriki couldn't even react when Itachi planted a fist covered in the last of his chakra in his solar plexus. And everything around Naruto went black as he slipped into unconsciousness. Kisame narrowed his eyes when he felt the sudden spike of chakra coming from where Itachi and the Nine Tails were fighting. He had never felt anything so powerful. Even when he unleashed all the power stored within Seimata, it was never that powerful. His face twisted into a menacing grin. He wanted that chakra. Even Seimata was getting excited in his hands. He would go there and take that chakra from the Jinchuriki for himself. And helping Itachi at the same time. He turned back to Guy, the smile didn't leave his face. You are a very good fighter, I enjoy the fight we have today. But I'm afraid I have to save it for another day. Then he flipped his hands through a series of very fast hand seals. Guy's eyes widened. Wait, that is. Water style, deep dungeon jutsu. Immediately, all the air around Guy turned into water. Literally. In just a blink of an eye, the taijutsu master was trapped inside a whole corridor full of murky water, which seemed to harden right after touching his body. So long, sucker, Kisame waved with a nasty grin, then disappeared in a whoosh. Guy's head was starting to get dizzy from the lack of air. If he continued staying in this water prison powered by tailed beast level chakra, he would drown in no time. No choice then. Seventh gate. Gate of wonder. Open. With an earth shaking explosion, the water dungeon was vaporized all at once by the humongous chakra exuding from Guy's body. The force was so great it destroyed the small corridor they had been fighting in, throwing all the debris around. But by the time Guy managed to recover his balance, Kisame had already been long gone. Damn it. Kisame whistled when he saw the terrifying scene of destruction in front of him. Wow. I didn't know there was someone who could push you over the limit like this, Itachi. That Jinchuriki surely is more powerful than expected, eh? Yeah, Itachi nodded between ragged breaths. But I managed to bring him down, anyway. Now let's get out of here before anyone arrives and ruins it. Ah, the shark man let out a whine of mock disappointment. I bet there is still some time for me to take some chakra from that Jinchuriki. It must be so delicious. No. Itachi's glare didn't even make the shark man flinch a little bit. Oh? You are not in a position to threaten me, Itachi, he grinned menacingly, and pulled out Seimata. With you being like this, I can easily cut off your head and bring both of you back to leader, that would be way easier. Itachi's face didn't show any emotion except for a raised eyebrow. But on second thought, nah, Kisame suddenly shrugged and put his sword back on its holster on his back. It's just not worth it to lose such a partner as you, eh? Alright, let's just get out of here, he said, hauling Naruto's unconscious body up, before that green freak catches up to us. Had Kisame not turning around, he would have seen Itachi grimacing. Then suddenly without warning, Itachi collapsed on the ground. He kneeled down on both his hands, puking out a glob of blood. Are you sure you can walk, Itachi? Kisame glanced back with a raised eyebrow. I can carry both you and the Jinchuriki if you need. No. No, I'm fine, the Uchiha croaked out, pushing himself up. Let's go. 
Just how much more dangerous can you become, Naruto-kun? Guy landed next to an unconscious Kakashi with a thud. He frowned at his rival's unmoving body. This is definitely not youthful at all, Kakashi. Tell me about it, the one-eyed shinobi on the ground groaned to answer him. Why did that Itachi have to be so cruel to me? What did he do? Guy raised one of his giant, bushy eyebrows. Kakashi groaned. He burned every single copy of the Icha Icha ever printed in the whole world, in front of me, and killed all the characters in the book for 72 hours straight. Really? Yeah, the oh so ever great copy ninja moaned. And somehow that managed to make me faint and leave my paralyzed like this. Help me guy, I can't even move my body now. Right at that time, Tsunade and her backup team landed next to the two shinobi. What the hell happened here? The Sanin barked when she saw the forest of thorny plants and the black flame still flickering around them. Guy lowered his head. I'm sorry, Tsunade-sama. Itachi Uchiha and his partner ambushed us when we arrived here, preventing us from going after Orochimaru. And he managed to capture Naruto Uzumaki. I will walk a thousand laps around the village with only a finger as a punishment for my failure. Following those words were the eeriest silence anyone could have ever heard. Then Tsunade's hands curled into fists. Boom. The remaining of the quarter walls shattered into a pile of dust. It seems Konoha isn't as powerful as we have expected. Yes, but Sasuke-kun is still gifted as ever. He will definitely make a good body if we can get a hand on him. Kukukaku. Sasuke-kun is not that important anymore. Did you get the DNA samples? Oh, of course. It was a bit of a pain to take it, but here we go. Soon, the perfect reincarnation will be completed. And nothing else in this world can match us. Yes. But now we will have to find a place to settle down first, Orochimaru-sama. This place is not suitable for your recovery and experiments. A long laughter echoed from five of the six human figures through the dark cavern. Soon. Very soon. This is Naruto Uzumaki, as you asked me to capture. Pain glared at the unconscious body of the blonde Jean Shuriki on the ground. Are you sure it was really him? And was he secured? Yes, Itachi nodded. So now that he's here, are the terms of the blood oath expired? Pain raised an eyebrow. Going straight to the point, huh? Yes, indeed, your side of the contract is completed. He pulled out a scroll with a bloody handwriting on the cover. Before the eyes of everyone in the room, it started burning away. The Uchiha's eyes followed it until there was nothing left but a pile of ash. So what are you going to do with him? Kisame looked at the boy on the ground. Are you going to keep him here until we manage to gather all the other Jinchuriki? Of course, Pain answered calmly. But before that? He stretched out his arm, and Naruto's body rose from the ground slowly until they were face to face. Then. Squelch. There, Payne said, his face was still disgustingly calm. That will ensure he cannot try to get out of here. To the horror of a few people in the room, including Konan, both of the blonde Jean Shuriki's arms were cut off cleanly by the sharp, black rod in the Rinnegan wielder's hand. The others, however, howled with laughter and mocking lines. Only Itachi's face didn't show any change in expression. He calmly walked up and picked up the two arms. Can I keep them? Why? The leader of Akatsuki said, his Rinnegan drilled into Itachi's eyes. Well, it's just a matter of pride to me, the Uchiha shrugged. I can't even keep a trophy for my victory? I didn't know you like to keep trophies for your victories, Itachi. Kisame raised an eyebrow. I thought only Orochimaru liked those kinds of thing. Itachi just shrugged again. Very well, I will let you, Payne's voice cut through the air. But before that, you will need to do one thing. It is just something to prove your loyalty to the organization. Itachi calmly met the Rinnegan with his own eyes. And that thing is. Destroy the right arm. Completely. In front of me. Itachi's eyes narrowed. Why do you need to? Do it, right now. Payne's voice once again seemed to be like a knife piercing the suffocating air. Or are you trying to defy my will? Itachi didn't say anything for a while. Then, he threw the right arm to the ground, and with just a glance, the arm was incinerated in a small Amaterasu flame. Good, Payne nodded. In his face, there was a hint of satisfaction. You have done well, Itachi Uchiha. Take a nice, long rest, you deserve it. Itachi just looked at the leader with a face completely devoid of emotion. Then, with a curt nod, he retreated from the room. When everyone else had disappeared from the door leading to the room, Conan, the only one left, asked tentatively. Is it really necessary? Payne turned his eyes toward her. Are you trying to defy the will of God too, Conan? The blue-haired woman cringed a bit under the glare. No, but. Isn't that too cruel? 
You didn't need to do that at all. Sooner or later, that Jean Chiriki will wake up, the body of Yahiko cut her short. And at that time, he will find out how helpless he is without being able to do anything. And that's when he understands true pain. Then he walked out of the room. Being left alone in the room, Conan painfully looked at the back of the retreated man whom she had thought to be her best friend. Nagato. What have you become? Hiruzen received the mission report from Shikaku with a frown going deeper and deeper on his face. Are you sure this is everything? That there was nothing else you could have done? Shikaku lowered his head. Yes, Hokage-sama. I'm sorry for the failure of the mission. I really didn't expect the plan to go awry like that. And Naruto was captured, if the Akatsuki managed to. The Hokage looked at the face of Shikaku with sympathy. The Nara strategist was the one who had formulated the plan for this mission, and he could understand why he was so upset, a complete, utter failure of the mission, plus the loss of an important asset of the village. It was not your fault, Shikaku. If there's someone who is responsible for this the most, that would be me, I was the one who miscalculated the power of Orochimaru too much. I should have expected that. If Orochimaru wants to run away, stopping him is nigh impossible. Don't blame yourself for the failure, no one could ever expect those sudden circumstances anyway. Shikaku bit his lips. Even if you say so. Suddenly the entrance to the room burst open, and Jiraiya stomped into the room. Kakashi and Guy have already told me about the failed mission, he growled. What's the big idea, Sensei? Surely you know how dangerous such a mission was, am I right? Why did you assign Naruto to such a mission? Now see here, Jiraiya. Suddenly the Hokage felt himself being lifted up by the collar. God damn it, Sensei. Jiraiya snarled angrily at Hiruzen's face. Naruto has been captured by the Akatsuki. How can you be so fucking calm about it? He could have been extracted already. Jiraiya, calm down. Those words were said with a normal, if not gentle, tone, but Jiraiya felt like he had just been hit with a ton of pressure. He released the Hokage's collar and stepped back, but his eyes were still both drilling at the man's face with a deadly glare. I know that Naruto is in danger right now, Hiruzen calmly said. But that doesn't mean I don't have any plan. Read this, Jiraiya. He pulled out a scroll from his drawer. Jiraiya took it from his hand, and his eyes widened when he saw the content. This is. That's right, Hiruzen nodded. Anbu, go to the hospital and call Tsunade to my office immediately. Jiraiya, go and prepare everything for a rescue mission. Tonight, the two of us will go rescue Naruto. Ugh. I didn't know being hit by Tsukuyomi could hurt so much. Kakashi groaned when he pushed himself up from the hospital bed he was lying on. Tsunade had been able to fix the damage in a blink of an eye, but right after he was carried back to Konoha, he was immediately put into intensive care by the legendary medic Nin, for further checking. And she had had a good reason to do that, after all, his body was still feeling sore. Sensei, you shouldn't force yourself, Sakura said worriedly. You should rest in bed for a few days before you can get back into action. I'm really the most useless sensei in the world. Kakashi lamented, his right hand curled up into fist. If only I had been able to do something. Yeah, that's right, Sasuke suddenly jumped in in a dry tone. What kind of sensei allows his student to be kidnapped without even being able to do anything? Before this blunt, straightforward accusation, Kakashi could only look away in shame. Sakura exclaimed, horrified. Sasuke-kun. You can. What can't, I do? The Uchiha snarled back, and Sakura unconsciously took a small step back when she saw the expression on his face. Thanks to him, I'm going to lose another person I consider precious in my life. And I'm supposed to be calm about that? Then he kicked the door open and walked out of the room. Sakura tried to run after him, but Kakashi's hand grabbing her wrist stopped her on her way. What? She cringed upon seeing her sensei's eye. She had never seen it so sad, so... Lifeless. I have failed you again. Sensei. Naruto. Alone in the corridor, Sasuke punched the wall next to him in frustration and anger. He didn't know what to believe in anymore. Just a few months ago, Itachi had still been a bastard who had massacred the whole Uchiha clan except for him to prove his power, then turned out he had been a hidden hero who had executed only the ringleaders of the clan to prevent a potential civil war in Konoha. And now, he had just captured his friend to get the tailed beast inside him for a terrorist organization to destroy the world. What the hell was going on in his life? Hey, have you seen Tsunade-sama? I have something to deliver to her, but she wasn't in her office. I don't know. I think there was an Anbu who has just come to ask her to go to the Hokage's office. Wonder what's going on though. Sasuke's ears perked up when he heard those words. 
The Hokage should have the answer for all of this happening. When he arrived at the office entrance, he was surprised when he heard the conversation coming from inside. What? Why do I have to hold the Hokage's hat for you? Calm down, Tsunade, he heard the voice of Hiruzen answering. I only need you to hold it temporarily for a few days. I and Jirai are only going to Amigakura to rescue Naruto, and then we will come back. I know that, but have you even thought about what you are saying? You are trying to storm the headquarters of the Akatsuki. They're fucking headquarters. At least if I can go with you too. If we all leave Konoha, there will be no one else here to defend it, Hiruz encountered. What if another village or Orochimaru decides to attack us while we're absent? Not to say there is still Donzo in the village, don't forget that we still have another Jin Shuriki here who needs to be kept an eye on. If it's not you, I cannot think of anyone else who I can trust for this job. Those words seemed to strike down Tsunade's argument. After all, she was one of the people who brought Fu back. And it's not like we don't have any backup plan, you know, the Hokage continued. After all, we have a person of our own inside the Akatsuki, and that person will be the one who assists us when we arrive at the village. Following this line was a very long, tense silence. Fine, I'll take the position, finally, Tsunade agreed grudgingly. But only until you come back, understand? And don't die, please. Outside of the room, Sasuke, couldn't help but thinking. So they're gonna go rescue Naruto, huh? Naruto was kidnapped? Kiba exclaimed in horror when he heard the news from Shikamaru. The Nara could only sigh helplessly. No way. Fu's eyes also widened in disbelief. How could there be someone who was able to kidnap Naruto-kun? He's. Shikamaru grimaced. Itachi Uchiha was the one who kidnapped him. Even Kakashi-sensei and Gai-sensei stood no chance against him and his partner. Silence filled the air for a few seconds. Then Kiba said angrily. Then why are we still here and not going to rescue him? Do you even know what you're saying, Kiba? Shikamaru snarled. They are the people even Kakashi-sensei and Gai-sensei didn't have a chance against. What do you think a bunch of snot-nosed brats like us can do? We don't even know where they are right now. How are we supposed to go rescue him and come back alive, huh? Crook. What Shikamaru said was so true Kiba couldn't find any word to retort, even though he hated what he had heard. He gritted his teeth, but didn't say anything. The whole restaurant became silent again. Then he not a sobbing voice started filling the air. For the girl not to faint upon hearing the news, it had been a tremendous effort. But hearing her sobbing like this was so heart-wrenching it made every single person in the restaurant grimace. See what you did? Kiba snapped at Shikamaru. You made Hinata cry. Oh? The Nara also snapped back. So it's my fault now? You are the one who forced me to tell you this news. Why you? Everybody quiet, everyone snapped his head back toward the source of the voice. Surprisingly, it was Lee who had just shouted out those words. This is not the time for us to argue with each other like this, the Taijutsu specialist continued with a calm voice no one had ever heard him using. If there is something I've learned since I became friends with Naruto-kun, it is that we cannot lose hope. Sure, Naruto-kun being kidnapped is a bad thing, but that doesn't mean we could just sit here and panic. I firmly believe Naruto-kun is not going down that easily, and we also have to put our faith in him. No one of the Konoha 15 in the restaurant could even say a word. They just stared at the boy who had just delivered his speech in shock and surprise. Then, Tenten said in a hoarse voice. Who? Who the heck are you? Are? Are you really Lee? I think Lee Kun is right, Karen raised her voice. Naruto is not that easy to break. I bet whoever kidnapped him is going mad from all of those pranks he pours on his head. Besides, how can the Hokage not do anything about this? I'm sure he's already figuring out a plan. Right at that time, Sakura burst into the restaurant. Has any one of you seen Sasuke-kun? What now? You also realized it, right Jiraiya? The Toad Sage answered Hiruzen with a snort. Of course I did. After all, he's still too inexperienced. Luckily he followed us instead of charging head first to Amiga Kur. Then the two men stopped abruptly on their way. Hiruzen glared at a tree afar. You can come out now. From behind the tree came out Sasuke. How did you know it was me? Jiraiya snorted. Please, Sasuke. Do you really underestimate us that much? To two cage level shinobi, your attempt in stealth is just like that of Konohamaru. We can notice you even if you're a mile away from us. Just remember, you're just a newbie chanin, you still have a lot to learn. Sasuke scowled. He didn't like being called a newbie at all, even by someone who was much older and much more experienced than him. What are you doing here, Sasuke? Hiruzen asked sharply. You do realize that as a shinobi, 
leaving the village without noticing the Hokage first might lead to you being branded a missing nin, don't you? Sasuke winced down to the piercing stare of the Hokage. I, I know, he stammered. But, if these things involve Itachi, I can't let that slide. He was the one who kidnapped Mai. He couldn't speak out the words best friend. Jiraiya scowled. This is not the time for acting hero, Sasuke Uchiha. You have to return to the village immediately, if you don't. Wait, Jiraiya. The Toad Sage snapped his head back. Sensei. Ignoring Jiraiya, Hiruzen calmly walked up, his eyes stared straight into Sasuke's eyes. The boy squirmed, he didn't know if it was true or not, but somehow he felt that the Hokage could read his mind. Alright, he will go with us. The two other males gaped at the Hokage's sudden declaration. Sensei? What the hell are you saying? Jiraiya was the one who erupted first. This might be a chance for him to understand everything, Jiraiya, Hiruzen said, and turned away. Now come on, if we want to reach Amigakur in two days, we cannot waste any more time here. Then he leapt away, leaving the two other shinobi standing there, baffled. After a few seconds, Jiraiya snapped. Well, what are you still waiting for? If we don't follow him, we will be left behind. Sasuke blinked. Ah. Uh, Right. The first thing Naruto knew when he woke up in the darkness was that he was in some kind of prison cell. Oh, right, Itachi captured me, huh? That meant he must be somewhere in the Akatsuki base. There was no way they could leave him anywhere else. And it seemed they didn't even bother to restrain him or anything. He looked down, and understood immediately why. On his shoulders, there were now only two stumps where used to be his hands. Naruto panicked. Guys? What the hell is going in here? No answer. Guys? Answering him was still only the eerie, deadly silence. Knowing it couldn't be anything good, Naruto sat down and tried to reach into his mind for his chakra. He couldn't feel any chakra inside his body at all. The truth hit Naruto with the force of a running truck. He staggered back and slumped into the ground, never before had he felt so useless, so hopeless, so despaired. It hadn't been even a year, yet he seemed not to be able to fathom going anywhere without his tail beast friends. But now, at a time like this, he should have screamed out in madness and rampaged around in the prison cell, or slumped down into the ground and cried his heart out in despair. Instead, he collapsed onto his back, his eyes had only a hollow emptiness. He had failed. Again. So Hiruzen has left the village together with Jiraiya to rescue the Jinchuriki? And he entrusted the Hokage hat to you until he comes back? Tsunade blinked against the unexpectedly calm reaction of the council. Yes. But that's it? I have expected you two to snap and make a big fuss about it, to be honest. Why should we do that? Koharu shrugged. Although we're kinda miffed that he didn't notice us before he did something like that, what's done is done. After all, you are the first person we consider for the seat of Hokage if something happens to Hiruzen. We can only hope he brings Naruto Uzumaki back to the village unharmed, though, we cannot afford another war right after Orochimaru's raid to the village. And the Uzumaki boy is too great an asset for Konoha to lose. Seeing Tsunade's confused face, Homura said. The second had his reason when he formed the Shinobi Council, Tsunade. The Hokage is indeed a very powerful Shinobi, but no one is perfect, even he will make a mistake someday. The role of the Shinobi Council is to stop him when he makes those mistakes. Before, when he made the reckless decision of telling Sasuke Uchiha about the true meaning of the Uchiha massacre, true, we freaked out thinking that telling him those things would only make the matter worse, then he might flip out and abandon the village in a whim. But it turned out not to be that bad, so. Tsunade was baffled. She really didn't expect those people in the council, especially those two people, to say things like this. But. Donzo. Aren't you two with him? Koharu scoffed. Donzo? Why should we follow that twisted old war hawk? He was the only shinobi in the whole village who didn't even do anything to help during the invasion even though we knew that he had a whole force of himself, always ready. Our loyalty is to the village only, why should we agree with a person who didn't even care about protecting her? The problem with Donzo is that he's always too extreme for his own sake, Homura added. Everyone could see why Toborama sensei didn't choose him as the third Hokage, except for Donzo himself. A Hokage needs to be, not only a powerful shinobi, but also a shrewd politician, and that is a characteristic Donzo can't, and will never have. Tsunade blinked again. She was the best medic in the world, she could know whether people were telling the truth or not by just a glance at their faces when they talked. And yet, she couldn't find a single expression, showing their lying. It meant, either they're both indescribably good liars, or they're telling the truth. 
Then a grin spread slowly across the woman's face. If that's the case. Hey, you. Wake up and eat your goddamned meal, brat. No response. Hey. Did you hear what I have just said? Move your fucking ass out of that place and eat these food immediately, or I will. Much to the Amiga Kura Shinobi's annoyance, the blonde Jinchuriki still didn't move an inch from his place on the ground. He just stared into somewhere far away with dull, empty eyes. He scowled, God had said that if the Jinchuriki wasn't taken care of properly, there would be consequences. And he really didn't want to face those consequences. Answering him was still the utter silence from Naruto. Completely losing his patience, he jumped into the cell, grabbing Naruto's face. The boy's emotionless eyes stared into his own. You want to play rough, eh? He snarled. Then I'll play rough with you. He squeezed Naruto's cheeks together, and the boy's mouth was forced open painfully. A glob of some disgusting thing that vaguely resembled food was shoved violently into Naruto's mouth, and the blonde nearly gagged at the scent of the so-called food. Naturally, he barfed all the food at his caretaker's face, and received a nasty punch to his own. Fine then, the cell guard snarled. If you want it like that, then just sit there and starve to death. Then he stood up and walked away, but not before spitting at the ground in disgust and disdain. Let me talk to your boss. Those words from the boy had the power to pull him back. What did you just say? Take me to your leader, Naruto said in a very calm tone. Unless you bring me to him, I won't ever eat a bite. Then a brutal punch to the face sent him flying into the wall. You little monster wants to show your face to God? The Ame Shinobi laughed cruelly. Let me tell you something, you are not in the position to demand anything, demon. Then he walked out of the cell, slamming the door shut behind him, leaving Naruto alone inside with a painfully swelling face. This is already the third meal he skipped, my lord, the Ame Shinobi kneeled in front of his god. I have tried everything, but nothing worked. He just insists on meeting you. Pain looked at the man kneeling below, the face of Yahiko still not showing any expression. So that's what he said, huh? Yes, my lord. If you think it's necessary, I will force the food down his throat. That's interesting. Bring him to me. The shinobi blinked upon the command of his god. Really? But. If he really wants to talk, I will talk to him, Pain nodded. Are you questioning my order? He finished with a deathly chill tone. The shinobi gulped. Of course there was no way he dared questioning the decision of his god. Yes, my lord. The next thing Naruto knew was that he was led into a dark room, the only source of light being the flickering candles on the walls. At the far end of the room, a glowing pair of rippled eyes was staring at him menacingly. So, what does the Nine Tails want to do with me? The cold voice coming from pain made the hair at the back of Naruto's head rose. But he could not let fear ruin what he came here today to do. I want to know what you want with me and the other tailed beasts, he said. I know that you won't send your people to go after Fuchan and me for nothing. And tell me, why should I tell you about that? Even without any expression on his face, there was no mistaking the mocking tone and what Pain had just said. Naruto gritted his teeth, of course he had already known what his intention was, but he could not let the Akatsuki leader know about it. You are Nagato, right? For the first time in a while, the face of Pain's body showed an expression. It was just his eyes narrowing, but that was still a lot considering it being just an animated corpse. How do you know that name? He demanded, his Rinnegan bore straight into Naruto's face. Naruto calmly met the gaze of the Akatsuki leader without flinching. My teacher is Jiraiya of the Sanin. He told me about a man with the Rinnegan who will someday become the savior of the world. That was you, wasn't it? It's not like there is someone else with the Rinnegan out there. The space between the two shinobi tensed up. Then Pain said in an emotionless tone. So Jiraiya sensei still remembers, huh? But. Naruto pressed on. If you really are Nagato, you shouldn't be doing this. Jiraiya sensei told me that the first book he wrote was about a shinobi based on you. But the character in the book is a peace-loving shinobi who wants to bring peace to the world, not a terrorist who wants to destroy the world like you. Answering Naruto was an eyebrow raised. Destroy the world, huh? I'm offended when you think my purpose was something that petty. What if I tell you I do all of this for the sake of the world, to bring peace to it? Naruto had heard this before. But that didn't make hearing it again feel any better. You're crazy, he shook his head. Do you even know what you're talking about? You said that you wanted to bring peace to the world, yet you gathered a bunch of terrorists and let them go around murdering and kidnapping people. What kind of peace is that? I see. Pain's gaze didn't leave Naruto's face. You are also someone who strives for peace. We both want the same thing, yet you're still too naive. 
you still haven't understood that this shinobi world is ruled by hatred, that's why peace can only be brought forth by someone who knows true pain. Naruto gritted his teeth. He had already known where this conversation was going to, and yet. So you're going to use the tailed beasts to hurt people, to bring them pain? Is that what you're trying to do? With the power of the tailed beasts, I will create a weapon which is far more powerful than any other kind of weapons the world has ever seen, Pain answered with a deathly calm tone, enough to wipe out a whole village. No, a whole country with a blast. The world will then understand what true pain is, and the fear will put an end to war. Even only for a little while. Is it because of your past? Naruto retorted. The pervy sage has told me that your parents were killed by Konoha Shinobi by accident. You must understand how painful it is to have your precious people killed like that. And if you do something like you said you wanted to do, thousands of people will feel like you already felt. Exactly, Pain nodded, his face still emotionless, but his voice clearly showed a hint of satisfaction. It's because I know how painful it is that I must do what I'm going to do. If many people feel what I felt, they won't be tempted to wage war to each other anymore. They will understand that wars will bring pain, and the fear of pain will stop them from even thinking about it. But if you do that, there might be a chance that there won't be any other people in this world for it to even be called a world anymore. Naruto shot back, but he knew he was grasping at straw here. He was running out of ideas, but he wasn't going to give up. And just as he expected, Pain retorted with a snort. Don't be absurd. No weapon can actually wipe out humankind. I will just use the weapon as a mean to show humans that war is hell. There is no way I will do something as meaningless as destroying humankind. Naruto nearly snarled. He knew that talking like this to Pain was just going to be a waste of breath. No other choice. He decided to use the final card on his hand. And what, exactly, is that so-called ultimate weapon of yours? The sudden question coming from Naruto actually had the power to make Pain stop his rant. What did you say? I was asking if you even know what you're trying to make, Naruto answered calmly, his eyes not moving away from the Devapath's face. Are you even sure that if you managed to gather all the tailed beasts you could control what would become from them? Naruto couldn't see the face of the real Nagato, but he could be sure that if there were any kind of emotion on his face right now, it would be confusion and hesitation. Whatever it is, there is nothing in the world these eyes don't have the power to control. Finally, after a few seconds, Pain said. But Naruto knew that even if he had tried to hide it, there was still a hint of doubt in his voice. He snorted. You really don't know anything. Your Rinnegan might be powerful, but how can it control something even the Sage of Six Paths? The original owner of those eyes, couldn't even have a hope to control. If you merge the tailed beasts together, you will just bring forth a monster which cannot do anything except mindless destruction. Suddenly Naruto felt his collar being lifted, up. Then, the next thing he knew was his body being shoved violently back, the back of his ribs crashed painfully into the stone wall behind him. He tried to speak, but he found his throat closed up, as if someone's hands were choking him. Gah! Now I understand. Pain's cold voice nearly made Naruto choke on his spit. You know you cannot do anything against me by force, so you're trying to trick me by your sweet words, make me doubt my own goal. But too bad, it is not going to work against me. You will stay in the dungeon until the beast inside you is extracted, and there is nothing you can ever do about it. Then with a sweep of his hand, Naruto's body was flung to the entrance of the room by an invisible force, and the guards outside immediately grabbed him and brought him back to his cell without the blonde being able to do anything about it. Naruto sat in the cold, dark cell, his mind spinning. He had always been proud of his charisma, his ability to make people listen to him, to understand him. He had believed that if he could talk some sense into Nagato's mind, he could stop the Akatsuki's plan right before it started, or at least, warn him about the ploy of Tobi, Zetsu and Madara before it was too late and the Uchiha bastard was revived. He just hadn't expected Nagato to flat out shut him up before he could even say anything like that. Contrary to what other people might believe, Naruto definitely wasn't a natural-born politician. A politician has to plan each word he's trying to say carefully, has to know how to manipulate people in their hands, and has to know how to lie through his teeth without even changing his facial expression. And Naruto couldn't do anything like that. He was only good at blurting out what he thought without thinking about the consequences. Therefore, when he tried to say something that followed a plan, naturally, he would fail horribly. Even worse for him. His caretaker had once again crept into the cell, and was now looming over him. He shivered upon remembering what happened before. He must be in here to work out his threat. Now as your wish has been fulfilled, don't you dare go against me like before, he said with a smirk. Naruto didn't answer. 
he just glared at the man in front of him with a look full of disdain. Of course, that didn't escape the eyes of the Almei Shinobi. What the hell is that, brat? You really want to die that much? He stomped toward Naruto, his fist raising high, obviously intending to give Naruto the beatdown of his life, but then. What are you doing? Both Shinobi's heads snapped to the entrance of the cell. Lady Angel. The guard exclaimed, definitely terrified. The newcomer, Conan, walked into the room. You, just get out of here. I will take care of him. But. Go. The Ame Shinobi cringed at the glare his angel had just given him. He squeaked out a yes ma'am from his throat and retreated from the cell as hastily as he could. Why do you have to make it so difficult? When they were finally alone, Conan suddenly asked. You are not going to get out of here anyway, why torture yourself like this? I won't stop until I beat it into his head that bringing the tailed beasts together will just lead the world to utter destruction, Naruto answered, not lifting his head up a bit. Conan scoffed. How long are you going to insist on that lie? It didn't work on pain, and it won't work on me, either. Save your breath, nothing you say can get you out of this place. Naruto lifted his head up, and Conan nearly winced when she saw his eyes. What makes you think I'm lying? Well, other than the fact you're sitting in our cell waiting for your death. She retorted. There isn't any reason for us to believe that you're not lying to save your ass. That was a very reasonable argument, and Naruto couldn't find any other word to answer. He could only grit his teeth and grimace in anger. Finally, he said. You are Conan, right? Pervy Sage has told me a lot about you. The girl with blue hair. Who was always the glue to hold the team together, the one with the calm head who was always there to knock some sense into the heads of the both her hot-blooded and gloomy, vengeful friends. Despite the serious air, Conan nearly chuckled when she heard the nickname from Naruto. I don't understand. You're supposed to be the smart one of your team, right? Then why didn't you stop him? I'm sure you know what he's doing is not the way to bring peace to the world. So why didn't you say anything? Those words from the boy made the woman cringe. Not because she was scared of him, no matter how strong he was, he wouldn't be able to do anything against her being disabled like this. It was because what he said somehow hit straight what she herself was thinking. You won't understand, she shook her head. You can't ever understand if you're not in Nagato's shoe. No one can ever understand. That his loved ones were killed in front of him? Naruto shot back calmly. My parents were killed right in front of my eyes when I had just been born. They were impaled by the giant claw of the QB right in front of my eyes. Right after I was born just a few minutes. Do I have the right to say that to him now? If he uses that as an excuse to destroy the world, he will just be a coward who instead of trying to fix the bad things in this world, wants to destroy it to escape the fact that he doesn't dare facing it by himself. Conan was stunned. She really didn't expect the Jin Chiriki to make a comeback like that. How can you even know about that? She looked at Naruto with narrowed eyes. I doubt you could even see anything when you had just been born for an hour. Naruto bit his lips. Yes, it's true. But hearing that from the mouths of my own parents. Do you think that makes it better? No. It's even worse, because I could only meet them for a few minutes before they faded away forever. And the QB? Before Conan could even question him how he could meet his already dead parents, he pushed on. Do you really think that she liked to have someone controlled her with the Sharingan to destroy the village? The tailed beasts aren't just mindless weapons of destruction, they know what is right and what is wrong. If you just use power to force them to destroy things against their will, you are just going to become like the orange masked bastard who did that to the QB with his Sharngan 12 years ago. Naruto only blurted out those words in a fit of rage, but suddenly Conan cringed up. What? Did you just say? Conan asked with a strained voice. A Sharngan wielding masked man? Yes. But. Uh oh. Did I just cause another unnecessary change in the timeline? To his surprise, Conan suddenly closed the door to the cell shut and sat down. You will tell me your story, in full details, without holding back anything. Conan sat in her room, her head spinning. She had been suspicious of that Dobi guy since he suddenly appeared out of nowhere and claimed to be Madara Uchiha, the former patriarch of the Uchiha clan, who had been supposed to be dead. Not to mention, the aforementioned Uchiha tended to act silly and carefree, but Conan knew that it's not what he was at all. And now, Hearing what the Nine Tails Jin Chiriki had just said, her fear had become clearer and clearer. It might just be that she's paranoid, but. What the Jin Chiriki said made too much. Sense. There was no way it could be that much of a coincidence, after all, how many people in this world would wear a mask and have a Sharn gun in the right eye socket at the same time? And somehow, the Jin Chiriki knew a lot of things he wasn't supposed to know about the masked man. 
He even knew Toby had incredible power in space-time jutsu, and he could use it to negate every attack from anyone. That was something only someone who had faced him before could ever know about, and if the Jin Shuriki had faced him before, no matter how strong he was, he would have been captured. Then the only possible explanation was that the Jin Shuriki had told her the truth, that his parents had somehow gotten into his head and warned him about the masked man. If what he said was really the case, then Toby wasn't trying to gather the tailed beasts to stop the wars humankind had caused at all. No way, considering he was the one who orchestrated all of them. What are you doing, Conan? Conan nearly jumped when she heard Nagato's voice channeling through Yahiko's corpse behind her. Nagato? No, nothing, she shook her head. The eyes of the corpse narrowed. Really? Remember, if you ever have any idea of crossing me. Conan looked straight into Payne's eyes. I'm your very first companion, and your best friend, Nagato, how can you expect me to betray you? But I can't say that with that Toby guy. I'm still surprised, you can trust him so easily without even any question. Payne raised an eyebrow. Who said that I trust that guy? Conan blinked. But. That Toby is a Nuchiha, Payne cut her short. He knows a lot of things we don't know about, and he also has some power which the Akatsuki can use. But that's also the reason why I cannot trust him. After our goal is completed, I will personally execute him. Such a dangerous man cannot be left alive in this world. Then he turned around and walked out of the room. Don't make me disappointed, Conan. You're the only one I can trust in this world, don't ever force me to do things I don't want to do to you, he said while his back was disappearing from sight, leaving Conan alone with her thought. Nagato. You said you want peace, but isn't what you have just said the thought of a hypocrite? At the same time, Naruto was panicking. He really didn't expect things to become like this. The one he had wanted to convince was Nagato, not Conan, at least not now. If it was Conan who knew. There might be a chance things would happen just like that time in his timeline. Conan went and confronted Obito to stop him from getting the Rinnegan, and was killed horribly without him even knowing about that. Or maybe Obito would be killed. He doubted that could happen, but still. Even though the Uchiha had done bad things, he still didn't want him to die without being at least able to talk to him first. He really didn't know what to do anymore. Never in his life had he wanted the advice of his friends as much as right now. Being alone in a prison cell like this, without even his own arms, he felt so hopeless, so... useless. And then, quite distinctively, Naruto heard the sound of a blade cutting through flesh, then a faint crash right outside of the room. He bolted upright, listening intently. Was someone trying to attack the prison? But there was no way, this was the middle of the Akatsuki headquarters, the guards here were all at least Chunin level, not to mention whatever defensive methods the Akatsuki had set up out there. How could someone get in here that easily, without even making any sound? Next moment he jumped as the lock let out a loud clack and the cell door swung open. Before he could even know anything, a fist buried itself into his stomach, and he didn't know anything else. Ruto. Naruto. Wake up. Naruto. Ugh. What the hell, Kurama? It's still early. Wait. What? Guys? Is that you? How did you? Naruto asked frantically, as if he couldn't believe in his ears anymore. His friends were here, he's not alone anymore. Now they could make their plan to get out of this place. Wait. Get out of this place? Wasn't he already moving? And how was he moving anyway? He opened his eyes, and realized that he was lying on the back of someone and that someone was running full speed in the shadow of the walls at the edge of Amiga Kour. He was lying on the back of Itachi, Uchiha. All the sleepiness and fatigue evaporated from Naruto's head as if they had never been there. He struggled madly to jump out of the other man's back, whom had just noticed Naruto's waking up. Oh, you're awake, he said as if nothing had ever happened between them. He let go of the hands holding him, and the boy fell onto the ground on his butt with a thud. He bolted up immediately and snarled. You bastard. You kidnapped me, sealed up my chakra, cut off my arms. And now, what the hell are you trying to do, huh? Well, even if I have to die here, I will not let you do as you wish anymore. Itachi only answered him with a disgustingly calm voice. Calm down, Naruto-kun, if you still want to escape. If you throw a fit like that, the Akatsuki is going to find out and catch both of us. Naruto couldn't believe in his ears anymore. Escape? What the hell? Itachi glared at him. Of course we're going to escape, what else do you think we're going to do? Now quick, before they can. Like hell. Those words literally stopped Itachi on his track. What? I said to hell with you, Naruto snapped angrily. Just one day ago you tried to kidnap me, 
nearly killed me and made me lose both of my arms in the process, and now you are trying to help me? Make up your mind. What the hell are you even trying to do? Itachi took a step toward Naruto. Now see here, Naruto-kun. Stop being such a brat hand. Then he had to retreat hastily as Naruto delivered a kick at his waist. Unless you explain yourself to me, I'm not going anywhere, the boy snarled. Even if I don't have my arms, I still have my legs, I will fight you to the death right here if I need to do so. Itachi couldn't say anything for half a minute. Then, at the 31st second, he glared at Naruto with a cold look and said. You want to know why I did this? Fine, I'll tell you. I went through all the troubles to do all of these things because it is the easiest way and causes the least casualty. What? Before, pain forced me to sign a blood oath saying that I have to capture you in three months or I would die, Itachi continued with the same cold voice. The enemy I'm following cannot be defeated by anything but the final evolution of the Sharingan. If I'm dead, there won't be anyone else who can go against him. Everything I have done was for the greater good of the shinobi world. Naruto couldn't hold back his rage. Now he had understood why Itachi had done that, but that didn't make him any less angry. So that's it, huh? He snarled. You don't care if anyone else could get hurt, as long as you can satisfy what you called greater good? Is that what it is? Yes, Itachi answered without any hesitation. If I have to kill one person to save thousands of people, I will do it without any regret. Naruto couldn't even find a word to say. Or it's better to say that he didn't know what to say against that utter insanity. Finally, when he managed to open his mouth to speak, these words came out. You're a bastard, Itachi sighed. Just call me whatever you want, I only did whatever necessary to. Don't you dare say that was the necessary thing to do, Naruto growled. Does that mean you don't care about the lives of other people you might harm in your way? They can die, as long as you have what you want? Saving everyone is just the dream of a naive child, Itachi shot back with a sharp voice. No matter how noble the purpose is, there is no victory which can be achieved without any death. You are just a kid, Naruto-kun, you don't understand what it is when you have to face a situation which has life or death as the only choices. And before you say it isn't fair, that's a part of humanity. There is nothing fair in this life, you have to accept it. Once again, Naruto found himself not being able to speak a word. He felt his stomach twisted with each word coming from Itachi's mouth. He remembered the word Shukaku had once spat at his face before in his mindscape in a scathing tone, for the greater good. He had really hated it when the tail beast had said that it's in the blood of every human. But now, when he had to face it himself. Facing someone with that ideal is the very purpose of his life. He knew it was wrong, but at the same time, he couldn't find any way to prove that it was wrong. He wanted to deny it, but at the same time, he couldn't find any reason to deny it. And who could blame him? The Uchiha in front of him right now wasn't the Itachi Uchiha he had known during his timeline. This Itachi Uchiha didn't have years burdened with the task of capturing the tailed beasts, he didn't have the time to reflect on what he had to do, and what consequences that action might bring. His mind was hell-bent on the plan he had hatched in his head, no matter how crazy or senseless it might be. He didn't have the time to figure out that he could depend on other people, as he had taught Naruto himself during his timeline, instead of just rushing ahead alone thinking that he was the only one who had the ability to stop the incoming war. In a sense, his mind only thought of himself. No way in hell. Itachi's eyes narrowed. What? It might be true. I accept that you might be correct. Naruto barked out at Itachi's face. But just because you're correct doesn't mean you're right. Who gives you the right to even decide that only you can decide the future of this world? Even if I don't have Sharingan or whatever the hell like that, I will still protect the world by my own power. Nothing is impossible if I have my friends, my comrades with me. Comrades, huh? The word actually made Itachi stop and think. Years in the Akatsuki, he had nearly forgotten what the word comrade meant. Kisame was the only one he could consider close to him and the organization, but there was no way he could consider him a friend or a comrade. Their ways of life were completely different, even though they're both in the Akatsuki, Kisame was a terrorist who intended to assassinate the Mizukage before and Itachi only acted like this for the sake of Konoha. Or was he? Itachi shook his head. Why did he suddenly think about that right now? Listen, it's not the time to argue here. We have to get out of here first, or they will catch up. Who is going to catch up? The interrupting voice made Naruto and Itachi's blood gone cold. They snapped their head back to see a pair, no, six pairs of purple rippling eyes glaring at them from afar. Pain had noticed their escape. Tsunade-sama. Tsunade looked up to see the Anbu member standing in front of her. Report, she commanded, 
and the masked shinobi boat. Someone sent this to you, milady. The legendary medic blinked before receiving the envelope from the Anbu. Who gave you this? It was one of the secretaries in the office downstairs, milady, the shinobi said. She also gave me some very strange words, Lady Tsunade will understand, then before I realized it, she had disappeared. I suspect it is something dangerous and should be disposed immediately. Please give the order, milady. Tsunade narrowed her eyes. Then, much to the Anbu member's surprise and horror, she ripped the envelope open. My lad. But he stopped when he saw Tsunade smirking triumphantly after she looked through the content of the envelope. It was just a stack of paper, nothing else. What happened, milady? Tsunade smiled and waved him off. Nothing you need to worry about. Go back to your work, please. After the Anbu had left the room, Tsunade put away the stack of paper and relaxed herself. The smile of victory never left her face. That's it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and follow me on my other social media accounts. Ma God here, and I'm signing off.